as I mentioned in the intro, and then thanks for that, Tony. Um, with the, the the government has brought in its social care and healthcare plans, um, and when we've heard a lot about the national insurance levy and the eighty six thousand k cap, so there are pros and cons to that, aren't there? You know, it's a good thing on the, on the one hand that the government's doing something about this, this issue, which is obviously a very present one. It's been we've been aware of it for some time, but but what are the let's start with the pros. You know, what what are the the, the pros of of the of the latest government plans? Yeah, I think it's worth noting that although national insurance um, has been criticised as a way of raising the money, in, in practice it was the only way of doing it. If you're going to raise the sort of money that we're talking about, which is £36 billion, you can either do it, you can only do it one of three ways. VAT, but that's the least progressive tax and that hits the poorest hardest. Income tax, the problem with that is that actually it's the easiest to avoid, which actually only needs national insurance. So it was the logical way to go. I think in terms of the pros, that successive governments have actually talked about trying to solve the social care crisis. And, and let's be clear, it, it is a crisis. Um, for, for decades, ever since the Royal Commission back in 1998, which pointed out what a mess the, the, the system was in, um, and they've talked about it, but they've done nothing about it. So here we have a government who have, have at last actually nailed their colours to the wall and said, this is what we're going to do. Um, and so from that perspective, that, that's really positive. It, at the same time, they are, of course, raising the, the threshold from 23,250 to 100,000, which you know will take a number of people out of having to pay at all. Um, and, and of course, the cap itself, which is the one that grabbed all the headlines, which looking at it from a positive perspective does at least raise awareness that, um, that contrary to what most people think, social care is not the same as NHS. You know, the NHS started in 1948, and we we and we sort of celebrate that fact, and, and quite rightly. But also, in 1948, we had the National Assistance Act, which which ultimately created the responsibility for local authorities to provide social care, and most importantly, means tested. Um, so, but yes, it did create more awareness that 86,000 being a cap by definition means that people will have to make a contribution, and that that has to be a good thing. Okay, um, and what are the what are the cons? <laughs> well, that could take a lot longer. Um, look, the, in terms of the cons themselves, um, there are, there are a number. Um, so first of all, um, nothing happens in terms of accumulation against the cap until October 2023, which means anyone paying anything towards their care costs that's not going to accumulate against the cap. Secondly. An individual doesn't make a choice as to about whether they feel they need or want care. They have to be assessed by their local authority as having eligible needs. And as I said just now, only one in four people actually are assessed by the local authority as having eligible needs. And it's only once they are assessed that they will then start accumulating against the cap. Probably the most damning in a way thing about the cap is you only accumulate against the cap at the local authority's own care component, not what the individual is actually paying. I think before I look at sort of what that means in practice, um, using the government's own sort of paperwork in a way, is that there is this perception that um, social care is very much part of um, state support. Um, and it's an extension of the NHS. Um, and people feel, in some ways quite rightly, that there is an entitlement. If, if the public understood that actually social care was more like an extension of income support, unemployment benefits, um, state pension, then they would un start to understand that this is, a, this is a safety net, right? This is a state looking after the people with the greatest need and the least ability to pay. So going back to sort of, if you like, the cons on particularly around the cap, um, the government recently um, re uh, released a paper called Implementation of the Cap Guidelines. Um, and in that, um, they put a, a, a sort of a pro forma together that explains how it would work. And, and I've replicated it on a slide. So if, you, if you put the first slide up, Adam. All right, so hopefully everyone can see this. Now that's that's the second slide. First slide, please, Adam. Yeah. 
Right, so this is, this is in the government's own paper, and it's an attempt to explain how, how people will actually accumulate against, accumulate against the cap and, and pay for care. So if you look at the left-hand side, you see, so it says, before reaching the cap, the individual pays. So the individual will pay his or her daily living costs, then they will pay their care costs, and ultimately they'll also pay at any additional top-up costs for better quality care. Right, and then after reaching the cap, the individual will only pay the daily living costs, which we know is 200 pounds, and then the, any additional top-up for better quality of care, because the state will pick up the care costs. So that's how the government has set out how it's going to work, right? But I think we can only bring it to life by looking at actually at an example. So if you go on to the next slide now, Adam. All right, so this is an example. So, so let's assume we're now post October 2023. So in November 23, Mrs. X, a widow, is assessed by a local authority as having eligible needs. I've chosen Gloucester because Gloucester is, is my own local authority. Um, she has chosen her own home and she's chosen a home costing £1,200 a week. That is sort of mid tier in Gloucestershire. Um, it's not expensive. Anyone on this call thinks that £1,200 a week is excessive, just has to go and look at decent quality sort of residential or nursing care homes. And of course, nursing care is likely to be even more expensive than residential care. So we look at the practicalities of this. So the way it would break down is that 200 pounds of that 1,200 would be deemed to be daily living costs um, because the total amount that Gloucester will pay is 620 pounds, right? So that's, that's, that's what Gloucester will pay. 200 is daily living costs, which means the care component for Gloucester is 420 pounds, which means if you break it down, you've got 200 for daily living, 420 is a care component and 580 pounds as a top up because that individual wants better quality of care. The way that the cap operates is you take the care component of 420, in this case it's Gloucester, and you divide that into 86,000, which, which goes 204 times. That means that individual will pay 204 times 1,200 pounds a week, which gives us 244,800 pounds before they hit the cap, all right? So the government are telling everybody merrily that they've solved the problem and you only have to pay 86,000 pounds. Actually, in my example, this person will pay nearly quarter of a million pounds before they hit the 86,000 pound cap. After that, then this person will live, in my example, another 30 weeks. They'll still pay the daily living cost of 200. They'll still pay the top up of 580. I've ignored inflation, otherwise the example gets ridiculous. They'll still have to pay another £23,400 because they'll only be getting the care component from the Gloucester, in this case, of 420. So the individual will have paid nearly £270,000 and the state will pay 12600 That's the cons, if you like. And, and, and in some way, it is a bit of a con. And the worst thing for me is that if people believe that they're only having to pay 86,000 pounds, then they won't plan for it. Uh, and, and, and the demand side that we really need to come through in this whole area of social care and later life will, will just not exist. Wow, I mean, that's really painted quite a stark picture, Tony, of, of, uh, of cost. That, I mean, I, I'd never imagined that they, they would kind of, I knew that there was an issue, but but I'm not a financial advisor myself. And I wonder if financial advisors watching this uh, are aware of, of, of this um, these levels of, of hid, hidden costs, if you will. Um, Matt, I mean, uh, Tony, we'll, we can come back to some some points around the cons because I'm sure we'll dig into to some of those and, and and how financial advisors can can play a role. But but Matt, while, while we're on this topic, from your perspective, um, well, firstly, were you aware of, of this as a as a, as a kind of a, a, a concept and, and secondly do you think many financial advisors that are, are doing specialist protection advice are also aware of this fact yeah morning um quite honestly I do feel like my share then that's um that's really quite stark isn't it? it's quite concerning i mean don't get me wrong i was aware that later life costs were 
were expensive. And I think, I, you know, historically, I admit I've probably been a little bit naive to it. And then when you hear that this this new cap out there, you kind of make the assumption that, oh, the government's putting steps in place to, to at least attempt to solve some of the problem. But it's pretty obvious that, you know, when you look into the nitty gritty of it, that's nowhere near sufficient and it's hardly going to make a dent in the later life living costs. So, um, yeah, no, I have to admit, I was I was very naive to it. Um, my my nan suffered from Alzheimer's for, for several years and went to care. And I was even back then, I was astonished at the cost of the care that she needed. And I knew it was unfair to consider that my mum would have to sort of care for on a daily basis. So it's just in reality, you've got that issue. And I think the other problem that, that we've got, and you touched on it when you opened up the webinar series a minute ago, is that you were talking about how the fact that a lot of the value of estates that would normally potentially provide towards this is being eroded through things like equity release and, and lifetime mortgages that are then being used to kind of fund other people's lifestyle before they suffer from the sort of things that they might need care for. So it's, it's kind of a bit of um, a toxic mix. You know, we're lasting longer, we're living longer, we've got advancements in medicine, and it is a real problem. The thing that really surprised me, and I was reading a, a Vitality article on the website the other day, and I saw that you'd surveyed a thousand of your serious illness customers. And there was an article in there that talked about 63% of those surveyed were worried about later life living costs. Then it said 58% were worried about dementia, which is significantly more than the potential of people that are actually getting dementia at this point in time. But it demonstrates that from a consumer perspective, there's a clear concern around this cost as well. And then only, like you said at the very beginning, only 11% are actually doing anything about it in terms of making any financial provision to cover the cost. And I think going back to what Tony said, there is this real concern in my mind that that it's all being blurred together and people do not understand the potential consequences of not having some financial provision in place. I mean, I'm not a financial advisor per se, I'm a protection advisor. And as such, you know, these aren't necessarily conversations that are within my, within my normal remit, let's say. So if you're a financial planner, you know, going back to your question about what, what financial advisors are doing, those conversations they're having. If you're a financial planner or a financial advisor, chances are there is some discussion around later life planning because you're discussing retirement provisions, what the client's going to need. You're looking at the value of their estate, etc. But certainly within my sort of world, we tend to be having conversations around lifetime earnings because we're relating it either to a mortgage the client might be taking out or we're talking around income cover. But we're normally considering our advice is going up to that age of retirement. And we're not really thinking about any, anything beyond that because we're kind of so focused on, on the immediate, the here and now, if you like, and, and certainly covering the debts that we're arranging for the client. But I think that goes to the point around what are we doing? to help support this. And I, I suppose one of the things I would say is that I generally try and take a very holistic approach when I'm giving advice. I'm thinking about, right, it's not just today because whilst I'm covering the client whilst they're working, there is an argument to say that if you do that correctly, you're actually ring fencing the client's potential to support themselves in later life anyway. So using an income protection as an example, if you're making sure the client's always got this recurring income, no matter what, even if they're incapacitated, and we are talking about potentially for the whole of their working life, if, if they get some sort of very serious condition, by having that replacement income available through the income protection contract, you're almost guaranteeing the client's then going to have that income coming in and can continue to make pension contributions and provisions so that later on in life they at least have that to fall back on. Now, I appreciate that's not, you know, the, the most robust financial planning, but certainly from what we do in the space that I've got, certainly within, say, the mortgage network space, where I'm not saying that we're discouraged from having those conversations, but it's probably not something that's the forefront of the advice conversation because it's just not being signposted. But I have to admit, I am very concerned that these conversations are not taking place. Um, it does concern me. I mean, listening to what Tony's just said, I was, I was quite astonished. And I, I think I'm even personally, I'm starting to feel concerned about what my later life planning looks like, because, you know, we're all attempting to try and retire as early as possible. We're all attempting to live off the equity and the, and the, the value of our estates that were built up. But this could have a significant impact on the value of those estates when you talk about the kind of figures, the weekly cost of later life care. And so it's really important to think about that and at least open the conversation. If you consider, as per your survey, 63% are concerned and 58% are concerned about getting dementia, that would suggest the vast majority of people that we're speaking to in the back of their minds have this concern. So then the question comes, as advisors, should we not at least be opening the door to have these conversations and signposting the potential solutions that are available? It sounds like to me, in my mind, there's sort of two misconceptions here. There's a mi misconception that needs, to, or the myth that needs to be busted, that actually social care costs aren't going to be covered by the, the government. I mean, it's great that they're doing something, don't get, get me wrong, but actually, the, and, it, and as to Tony's point, it's, it's great that it's put some attention onto the issue and there's, a, there's some conversation around a solution. 
the other misconception I guess is around that advisors necessarily don't have a role to play you know and actually you, you highlighted some of the uh, the challenges that advisors might have, Matthew, around kind of maybe on, in the mortgage space, so, you know, and we'll, maybe we'll touch on some of the compliance ramifications of that. But but another one, Tony, maybe is that there aren't. There's been a lot of talk in the protection market about whether there are protection products out there, later life insurance options out there, and and there are some. I mean, I think your view is, Tony, to not to put words in your mouth, but there is that more can be done. But let's kind of maybe take a moment to sort of uh, remember that. That there are packet, there are products as well as the IP example that Matthew gave, but also there's the the conversion of, of serious illness cover or, or whole of life products on the market that can automatically, effectively cover the costs uh, of social care um, if if that if they're needed. So is that is it worth kind of pausing there and reminding people that the that, that, that advisors do have prepackaged solutions available? To them? Um. I think it is. I think before I address that specific point, I think what, what Matthew said is is absolutely right. You know, we we know that there's there's a considerable protection gap exists in 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 the UK as it is. But if people have the right protection in place, whether that is you know serious illness, critical illness, income protection, um, it, at least if they've got that in place, they've got a fighting chance of having enough income or having capital such that they can they can at least prepare for some sort of the social care cost later in life. If actually they've struggled during their lifetime because they've not got protection, frankly, they've got not a hope in hell of actually being able to afford anything in terms of topping up social care costs or, or actually funding social care costs in their entirety. When it, when it comes to actual what actually exists, um, yeah, there, there, are, there are products out there. Um, I mean, the government are really, really keen that the industry develops products. Um, right now, I can I can tell you that there aren't any any life companies out there that are currently looking to develop new products in this market because they don't believe there's a demand for it. Um, and, and we could touch on that later on. In terms of the products that do currently exist, um, unsurprisingly, um, Vitality is one of them. Um, and and and. AIG is another. They they do it ultimately in very different ways, um, but they are ultimately whole of life policies that will pay out um, if someone has a care need. Um, the the vitality contract obviously has this particular thing around dementia, but ultimately it, there is also a contract within the, the vitality range that will pay out on care. Um, now I don't think it matters. Um, well, I think it's really important that it pays out on the basis of potential either death or care, because it's hard enough probably selling long-term care insurance because there'll always be the objection, well, I won't need it. But if it actually pays out on death, if you don't need it, that's that's absolutely great. Um, but um, I think there is, I don't think there's any reason why people actually can't, rather than sell it as a whole of life policy, but actually if you need care, then there's this bit that pays out. You could easily flip that on its head and say, well, actually, this is a long term care insurance, but actually, if you never need it, then it will pay out on death. Either way is, is fine, but they, they do exist. Um, the vast majority of advisors, in my experience, don't know they exist. Um, but um, yeah, they are there. And, and hopefully this series will start to make people aware and, um, and, and have conversations with, with clients. I think the difficulty with having a conversation with clients is there needs to be more done from the government on the demand side so that people do understand that this is a really serious problem because you know most people know that there is a potential for them to die well actually no most people know that everyone will die um, most people know there's a potential that they may become sick so therefore the idea of protection is something that will be in their minds it still has to be sold the idea that someone an advisor will be able to sell long-term care insurance when selling protection is hard enough, but selling to a need that people don't believe exists, I think is, is bordering on impossible. Uh, I think it's a really good point. And on that point, Matthew, um, what, what, things, what do you think is going to drive this awareness? And, and, and actually, before we tackle that, as Tony just pointed out, there is a way, there are products there. Um, when it comes to positioning from the client, um, Bear in mind they can be they are often built into a recommendation 
um, in the cases than the examples that Tony just gave. As an advisor, how would you look to position that in a way that is compliant, that, that doesn't veer into territory that ultimately you don't feel comfortable veering into as a protection specialist? You mentioned signposting would be one way to go about it if, if you were going into later life planning. But it sounds like here there's a solution that, that should overstep that compliance. But I'm not an advisor, so I'll leave that to you to answer. No, that's a, that's a really valid point. I mean, Tony's absolutely right in everything he's saying. I, I think it's a really valid point, Adam, because if you're having those conversations with your clients, you need to be thinking, right, well, I'm discussing the, re the relevant insurances that I need to for the needs that I've identified. But when you say needs you've identified, are those needs that the advisors identify, the needs that the clients identified? So what I'm talking about there is potentially sparking that that notion in the advisor's mind that they ought to be at least signposted the issue and then either provide a provision or signpost someone else who, who could potentially provide that provision. Now, in the case of the vitality contracts, when we're saying that, you know, dementia care um, and, and frail care cover can be added to the policy free of charge. I mean, if you're arranging a sick policy and, you, and you've then got that option, it would be foolhardy not to do it. And I would encourage every advisor to sort of place those policies to just tick the box and add it in. Obviously, there then needs to be discussion around whether the, the plus option is a more appropriate one. But having that in there in the first instance is a great trigger to start having the conversation. And I wonder if that's actually one way to go is that more providers consider, and I would like to see more providers considering introducing these kind of um, benefits into their plans because just purely by having the option to tick means that you're then going to engage with the client when you're discussing it because it's almost like a, a trigger to have the conversation, a flag to at least discuss it. So having those options are available, um, certainly for the vitality proposition, I know you mentioned the IAG one as well with the whole of life conversion. Having these products available is a, is a massive leap forward in my mind because as Tony said, you're either going to try and create demand at consumer level, which I don't think the government's doing anywhere near enough in that respect because I mean, I don't think many people even think there's an issue. I think most people, as Tony say, are focus on the here and now and they're not even thinking about later life it's almost like it's not going to happen to me it's hard enough as a protection advisor to convince people to part with their hard-earned money during this cost of living crisis to protect themselves and their incomes and and other things as well to then have a discussion around something that may or may not happen 30 40 years down the line it's a bit like pension contributions you know you see that kind of conversation around oh yeah well i'm young and i'm fit and healthy i'll worry about my pension when i reach my 40s people not understanding the value of contributing when you're much earlier in terms of growing that fund so it's the same kind of concept so having them built into the application process having the flags and the triggers to at least spark the conversation and encourage advisors to signpost that issue I think it's a really important step forward and I think Vitality is certainly leading the way in that respect. I just think it's really important that advisors understand that if if no one else is going to raise this issue, they ought to be doing it as part of a holistic advice process. I mean, the fact that we said a minute ago, 63% of the people surveyed were worried and 58% worried about dementia suggests that actually clients are concerned, but perhaps it's up to the advisor to kind of open the conversation because they're limiting their frame to what well, we're discussing the mortgage or we're discussing this or we're discussing that and kind of just at least signposting it i'll give you a prime example of this i remember a while back and i've always been concerned from a compliance point of view because certainly working within an ar or network environment there are i wouldn't say restrictions but you have to be mindful of the scope of your advice and whether you're then starting to veer into planning territory and you're really kind of going outside of your remit so I remember having a conversation with a client a while back who was looking at a term assurance life contract and we were looking at the various different things. And it was actually the client that signposted the issue of conversion option to me. And it was just a bit of a shock moment for me because I sort of thought, well, I hadn't really ever necessarily discussed it unless the client, unless was, I identified a specific need. But actually in the client's mind, they were thinking I would at least like to have the option. And it got me thinking, I really need to do a lot more research and advise into conversion options. And I don't mind putting my hands up and saying, you know what, I needed to look into that a bit more and understand it better and, and how I might be able to better service my clients and provide more robust advice. But only until it was exposed to me did I start to think, actually, I really now ought to be having that conversation with every client I speak to. Have you considered the option of converting this later in life? Have you considered the option of later life care? And what you do is you then integrate it into your fact finding process. It just becomes part and parcel of your conversations and in doing so you open up the opportunity for the clients and say 63 percent of them to say yes that's something i'm worried about i think it's a really good example of bringing the advice process to life there. effectively matt all you're really sort of saying is, is do you want to carry on paying premiums for this policy after after its term right and, and surely that's uh and it, you know if they don't they don't 
Um, but if they want to keep the cover in place, at a point when they're probably much less insurable, let's be honest, at the age of 66, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to get the same turn. So there's a there's a kind of a, a no-brainer. It's a really valid point. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just saying it's a really valid point because from an advisory point of view, generally speaking, to be compliant, we're thinking about needs and objectives that we can identify today in the here and now. We're not talking about potential. So, for example, it would be unreasonable to consider putting children's cover onto a policy for a couple that don't have children, right? Realistically speaking, because at this point, we can't identify a need. Now, if that need changes, you would be thinking, right, let's have another discussion. Do we need to introduce this, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, in many respects, from a compliance point of view, a lot of advisors are probably reticent about discussing it because they're thinking it's outside of the scope of the here and now and the immediacy of what I can see in front of me. But actually having these options then opens up that possibility to say, well, actually, I am providing holistic advice. I am considering the best needs of my customer, not just today, but in the future, but not placing any sort of limiting restrictions on them that they're paying the price for that now. And I really like that because for me, it allows you to open up the conversation, but do it in a fair compliant manner. I love that and I think that brings us neatly onto the subject of consumer duty. You know that's what you've just described then Matt sounds I mean while we don't know exactly what the FCA is going to be asking for through consumer duty that sounds very much like the sort of thing they're going to be asking. You know, it's future proofing your advice, it's making sure that it remains relevant, it's making sure that you're considering their needs not just today but in the future too. And, and Tony, I know you've got some strong views on consumer duty and um, it'll be good to hear you kind of whether you know whether this is something that will play into it you know um, and and we talk about fear of being compliant when offering too much um of insurance right but but is there a obviously there's a balance needs to be struck but is there a is there a danger here if we over if, we, if an advisor were to overlook this need uh potentially going forward i i think um before touching on consumer duty um i think a lot of compliance departments in all sorts of businesses have, a, have an issue with this selling to a future need. I think the, the example that Matt gave in terms of a couple that don't have children. Um, and in terms of that example, I sort of get it. Um, but when it comes to care, putting aside the issues we've already touched on in terms of the demand, if, if you look at the, the contracts that currently exist, they, these are options. No one has to exercise the option. So I think it would be really I would really challenge any compliance department who says you shouldn't take out this contract because you're selling to a future need if actually these are options that never need to be exercised unless that situation arises. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure that there is a compliance angle there for me. Um, consumer duty is, is an interesting one. Um, so, so if you look at the, some of the cross-cutting rules, the one that's going to really resonate here is this uh, avoiding foreseeable harm. Um, and if you look at some of the examples, or well, one example in particular that, um, that the FCA used to try and demonstrate what they mean, which is a good example in some ways, but a bit simplistic, which is if you have a mortgage advisor who you know, arranges a mortgage for a client but doesn't discuss protection, that is a really good example of failing to avoid foreseeable harm. Um, and you know, as bad as it sounds, um, current industry figures are that only about 14% of clients who are actually taking out a mortgage actually take out protection. So I think there's quite a lot of work to do in that space alone. I think it would be quite a stretch to suggest that someone who is relatively young, um, it would be a definition of, a, of failing to avoid foreseeable harm if you didn't talk to them about potential care costs. Um, I, I don't think the FCA would, would take it quite that far. But the same token, I, I think when you get to points where there are very obvious triggers in people's lives, um, such as the point at which they are taking retirement and they're looking at their drawdown options, you know, not to talk about, well, what about if you have a care need? That for me would be a definition of avoiding foreseeable harm. Another example would be, um, and this is probably less an example around consumer duty, but more of an example around where it would be an obvious trigger for people to talk about this is, you know, um, is when you've had to help your parents go through care and all of a sudden you've realised just how expensive it is, just how complex the social care system is, and actually that now you're not going to inherit their property. So actually, what's the way I can do this? Because 
there are only two ways of, um, of effectively dealing with your own personal social care costs, and that is accumulating enough money through any source, whether that's ISAs, pensions, investments, whatever, or insuring. I mean, that is it. There are only two. So, um, so yeah, I think consumer duty will play a part, but I, I wouldn't overplay it for a lot of clients. So what you're sort of saying there, Ted, is that this isn't just a protection conversation. This is an intergenerational wealth conversation and, and one Absolutely. that doesn't have to be overly complicated. No, it, 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 it doesn't. It just it's making people aware. Right? Matt said earlier the government haven't done anywhere near enough. Right? The government have effectively been hoisted by their own petard to use a really poor expression. Right? They've, they've done something. Right? They've, they've increased the awareness. They've introduced this cap. With the best will in the world, they are not going to now stand up and say, do you know we told you it was only £86,000? We were only kidding. It's way worse than that. Right? They're not going to do it. All right, so whether we like it or not, there is only one group that is realistically going to have any any chance at all of making clients really aware that the vast majority of their clients that they sit in front of on a regular basis will be self-funders, and if they have a care need, and it will apply to a lot of their clients, that they will be paying a considerable amount of money, unless they're quite happy for someone in the local authority who they don't know from Adam they're happy for that person to choose what type of care, where they have it, and how they have it. Right now, I don't know about you, but I'm—I don't want to go there, and I suspect most of the people who are listening on this broadcast, their clients wouldn't want to go there either. So yes, it is much more complex than protection. It's a much broader conversation, but I do believe protection has a massive part to play. Yeah, yeah, it can it can play some at least some role. Um, I. I, f I find that interesting as well. The idea that the what often drives dem demanding clients are bad outcomes, um, yeah. and one of the things I, I guess we you know, we aren't seeing a lot of yet are bad outcomes. But and I think it's in the, the point you make about the trigger points and the, and that kind of the demographic that are likely to be a, a, a kind of a client that would would be suitable for this sort of advice. You know, it is where your parents are. You know, using equity release perhaps or you know funding their own social care and and I, you know it's that generation of of um young families i suppose or, or the sandwich generation we're, we're often described as um that that could actually be open to the idea of well actually i want to make sure that my legacy is protected um and, and it doesn't necessarily have to always be a, a specific product in, engineered for dementia for our care later life lifestyle care whatever it can sometimes just be as simple as making sure they're protected in the first place and matt i can imagine that just forms a lot of your conversations already and before you answer that i just want to pause and just remind the audience they can ask questions of both matthew and tony we've had a couple come in and some great comments please use the chat box we'll be moving into some period where we can quiz them on, on your thoughts but but matt yeah so this is a kind of a this is a, this is basically just best practice around what protection advisors should be thinking about already Exactly. I mean, Tony makes some very valid points, by the way, about consumer duty and, and the risk of being blasphemous. Let's ignore consumer duty for a minute and talk about what we as advisors ought to be thinking ourselves, because, you know, as an advisor, for me, I'm generally I don't need a duty or a regulator to tell me to consider the best outcomes for my clients. Now, I don't get me wrong, I get it. And I appreciate that you have to have regulation and interpretation of those uh, of those duties, etc. But I guess from my point of view, of course, I'm going to signpost the question because whether the client's young, whether they're old, I, I feel a need to protect their best interests at all times. That's my client. And it's a reflection of me if I do or I don't. So when I'm having those conversations, of course, I'm going to signpost it. Of course, I'm going to make them aware. And I may be thinking, look, I'm having this discussion with you about something that may happen 30, 40, 50 years down the line. But that's still my job to do that. And I take that very seriously, regardless of any consumer duty. So really, really interesting point. And there was a couple of things Tony said I thought were really, really interesting because yes, the trigger points. I mean, the one you raised about um, parents and, and when you have to put your parents through care, and that's obviously something I've done with my nan, which then has sparked a need. And then of course, the same thing might occur with my parents as well. So that's a really interesting trigger point. I think the challenge we've got as advisors is that if clients are being signposted to these issues and signposted to needs that later on in life that they're looking at pension drawdown. At this point, do we not argue it's potentially too late? It's too late, a bit like pension contributions. It's a little bit too late down the line to be having this conversation. You touched on it earlier, Adam, about 
trying to arrange care for someone at the age of 60 plus suddenly becomes a lot more challenging if they've got medical conditions and at that age it's, it's far more challenging to get it through underwriting so i think it's logical to signpost it i don't feel it's necessarily something the consumer duty is going to have an issue with or drive they're not going to probably drive the agenda to be discussing later life planning at the age of 25 and i don't think they'll have an issue if we don't but i just think as an advice community it's something we ought to be doing particularly now tony so eloquently highlighted the potential issues i think it's it's something that we should have a duty of care to do and i think if you can't advise on it or if you don't feel comfortable advising on it then going back to the thing that we're banging the drum for so long about signposting if you don't feel comfortable that's not a problem signpost to a financial planner signpost to an advisor signpost to a specialist and just make sure you're taking care of your clients not just today but in the future if you don't feel comfortable giving advice in that space not a problem pass it on to someone who can and, and on that point, Matt, Matthew, when it, when it comes to positioning something like a whole of life policy with a, with a client, um, understandably, there's some nervousness around covering someone for their entire life. You know, no no, no advisor wants to overinsure their client and, and then be penalised for it. But as an advisor, there are ways that you you've positioned a whole of life as part of a package, maybe attached to a, a term life policy, just to cover things like funeral costs and, and other other kind of perhaps IHD planning, all that sort of stuff. Um, which obviously the kind of the conversion products we, we've we've talked about would would effectively do. But uh, but as part of that, you know, ultimately you only need to look at the over 50s plan market to see that there's demand there. So is this something that you're fully aware of? Yeah, absolutely. And it's something that I, I guess, and again, I, I can't speak for all advisors, can I? I mean, I can only speak for the, the sort of people within my my uh, my immediate sphere. But when you talk about mortgage advisors or mortgage and protection advisors, protection advisors working in a network space, then whole of life becomes almost like a secondary conversation in some respects, because yes, it might be discussed, but generally speaking, you're tending to focus on the immediate needs, as I said, because you're not necessarily thinking about that sort of stuff. And, and I wouldn't say compliance are anti whole of life but it's just less of a consideration potentially than the immediate needs that are identified when you're arranging liabilities on behalf of the client so i would encourage more advice to at least have that conversation because i do believe whole of life forms a part of that protection uh, bubble and you're talking about right well we've got these immediate and I, I often talk about arranging things in channels is the best way i like to describe it so right income need for client one income protection family income benefit income need for client two it's income protection, family income benefit. Then we talk about, right, mortgage need. Do we have a mortgage, right, mortgage life insurance? Do we have a critical illness need? Do you, do you need extra bit of lump sum? Fine, okay, lump sum critical illness. Whole of life, do you need funeral cover? So it's, it's having those conversations and just identifying those potential challenges for the client. And by doing so, by opening up the conversation around whole of life, you start to discuss things like later life planning. And then you can at least introduce some of these conversion options or the dementia and frail care cover. And at least you're sparking the conversation as part of a wider holistic advice process that's not limited to the very thing that the client's sitting in front of you for, i.e. say a mortgage and mortgage protection. I think Tony's point's a really important one. He talks about how the only two ways that which you can do this is by either building up sufficient capital or equity or money to be able to fund later life care or through insurance contracts. Now, from my point of view, I would argue that protection insurance plays a role in both, because how could you possibly consider being able to accumulate equity funds, whatever, unless you protect the very income sources that you're using to build those platforms, right? So my, my whole argument here is that protection advisors need to be awake to the fact that actually it's protection that underpins it all. This is the foundation to be able to put the client in the best position possible so that later on in life they have the available funds or capital equity or insurance to be able to to mitigate these potential risks and from that point of view i i would argue that falls very much within the remit of the consumer duty fantastic um, moving over to some of the questions then martin o'connell um, has actually asked and this is sort of to your point, Tony and Matt. You both made this point about the, you know, the question around it's great the government are doing something, but but is it enough? Martin wants to go further and says, so, so do you think the government would consider tax relief on premiums for insurance contracts that pay out in the event of later life costs? Be um, nice, wouldn't it? It, it? it would. It would be lovely. Um, I think. I think we all just need to remember that there is no country on earth could afford to pay social care costs for 
everyone to have the type of care that they would choose, right? It, it, it would bankrupt every country on earth, right? So we have to, we have to, I think, accept that one of the things at least that their government have done is that they they put up a nail in the wall and said, this is what we're going to do, right? But it is, and I would reiterate the point I've made earlier, it's state support, which is there for the most, most vulnerable with the least ability to pay. In terms of the question itself, um, yeah, it would be great. I can't see it happening, um, given the state of uh, finances in this country. Um, what I can see happening, um, and um, it's been called for by a number of people, including um, a paper I wrote on, on social care, um, and also by a group called Tizer, who um, are meeting with the government next week, and I'm included in that, is that we're, we're calling for uh, pensions to be um, a source of uh, funding for social care um, and for people to be able to draw down from their pensions without paying any tax on that. Um, and we're calling for three things, um, and, and that is for people to just draw down, if, they, if they're going to use it to pay care costs, to draw down without paying tax, to be able to take a lump sum outside of the uh, tax-free lump sum that they can normally get, if they're going to use it to buy an immediate needs annuity, again, without paying income tax, or um, to actually be able to take money from their pension again tax free in order to fund insurance. So that's 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 what we're asking. One of the things that we're asking of the government. We're also asking um, for them to do things like sort of care ices. And not that I think that that's a, a massive solution, but the more you start bringing social care products onto the market, it just increases awareness. It makes people think, wait a minute. These products wouldn't exist if there was a need for me to actually potentially invest in them because I'm going to have a responsibility to pay for care. Um, I know that's necessarily answer the question, but well, that's that's what the current uh, one some of the current asks are. I genuinely think it would be just too expensive um, for 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 the for the country, um, and I pretty much know that the government aren't offering that. This is that chicken and egg scenario again, isn't it? This is what comes first with demand. Is it kind of a an awareness of the problem or, or actually proactively people going out and talking about it. That is um, a really good point, Adam. Sorry, I just wanted to say, I, I, what you're talking about there, first, those ideas are phenomenal. And I think those are really, really good to perform because I can see those as practical solutions, genuine practical solutions that could be implemented. But I also really love the idea of the savings ISA, you know, the care ISA. So if you were to get, say, tax relief on savings ISAs, which are designed for later care life, and it went above and beyond what you normally do with, with your other products, so this additional tax relief, what that does is it just... Like you said, Adam, in terms of chicken and egg, which comes first, the drivers of demand? Well, clearly, through your research at Vitality, people are concerned. So if you give them a ready-made product that they can utilise that meets that concern, it sort of almost takes a lot of the responsibility away from the advisors in that the product's there and available to use, and it's a logical conversation starter. Absolutely, absolutely. Turning to another question then. Um, one of the challenges that advisors face is they don't know how to determine and recommend a sum assured and we'll use that as a reason not to bother. Do you have a view on that, Matt? Yeah, that's a, that's a very valid point, to be honest with you, particularly when it comes to things like whole of life plans, because that's where the, the huge grey area lies. Um, mm. I mean, again, that's a challenging one. I tend to think when I'm doing whole of life, I tend to discuss funeral costs. So if we're talking about certainly within a mortgage sphere and I'm chatting to a client about mortgage protection, uh, having gone through the other recommendations, I'll be chatting to them about the likely cost of a funeral and maybe even go as far as doing a little bit of research with the client in terms of what their likely funeral would cost to give me a lot of steer around the sum assured. And then I add that to my compliance recommendations so I can demonstrate how I've calculated the sums assured I want to. Just, just give me and the client that reassurance that we've gone through some sort of logical process to determine the amount of cover they need. Um, it is a difficult one. And I do think you're right. It turns a lot of people off and a lot of advisors probably because it's more pain than it's worth, we'll just focus on what they know comfortably, what they can see in front of them in terms of mortgage liability, income needs, things like that. Um, but I would still encourage advisors to have the conversation because as we've seen, as Tony's quite beautifully pointed out, there is a real catastrophic issue here and it is something that should be discussed. So just put that little bit of effort in, look at the research in terms of things like funeral costs, the clients at least got some provision in place that you can utilize. And if it's baked into the proposition as a freebie, then there needs to be clicks and option, then, then there's, that's at least a start in the right direction. Tony, do you have any views? Oh, of course, I've always got views. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, I think it's, 
I'm not sure I'd buy that advisors are turned off because of the difficulty of calculating the sum assured. I think what they're probably more concerned about is their compliance department asking them, how the hell did you arrive at that sum assured? Um, um, particularly off the back of, you know, PS21.5 and consumer duty, because you've got this whole sort of, you know, not only sort of good outcomes for clients, but, you know, what, what represents fair value? Um, and, um, but for me, there are, relatively straightforward way of doing it the younger the client is clearly the harder it's going to be because there's a bigger gap between taking out the policy and when they're likely to need it but the only product at point of need that exists in the care market at the moment is an immediate needs annuity which um, ultimately is a is a piece of mind contract uh, it's a lump sum that will make sure that they will pay care fees for as long as that person lives um, now the average cost of an immediate need annuity in this country and has been for a number of years is around 115 to 120,000 pounds. So for me, that would be a reasonable starting point. Yes, you could then say, okay, well, if you're you know that much younger, then let's add on a bit. But the reality is, the 200,000 pounds policy for me would probably cater for 90% of all people uh, in terms of paying for for care needs. Not that they have to then use that to buy an immediate needs annuity, but, but they could. But it, it's a reasonable starting point. You've solved so that problem, Tony, because they're going to reference you in their compliance now. Tony must said. <laughs> Be careful oh, as, long with that as, they, as, as long as they work for SJP, they're fine. If they don't, then come and join us. But it's interesting, though, isn't it? That ballpark figure that we can almost estimate around cost of care, some assured. Um, I, yeah, I wonder if there's, there's some work to be done. Um, I, I have to admit, Matthew, the, ref the research you're referencing, um, I can find clarity on this. I have a feeling that was maybe done before the cap was introduced. So I wonder if there's space to have a look at whether perceptions have changed post cap. Uh, but yeah. don't quote me on that. I probably should have got on air with that uncertainty. But I think it's worth pointing out. There's there's maybe some some mapping out we can do. Um, so we're, we're almost out of time. Um, we've had some great comments. Uh, another one from Martin O'Connell mentioned, in my experience as a provider and a client, uh, financial advisors are not having these conversations with clients. Um, hopefully, after this discussion, more of them will be taking place. Um, but just to wrap up, then, do we do we do either of you have any sort of closing comments? Um, we've covered a lot of ground here. We've covered consumer duty. We've covered intergenerational wealth, the products on the market. Matt's kindly shared some of the the ways they key, he brings them to life with his clients and some of the compliance ramifications. Tony, you've, you've, you're teeming brain when it comes to uh, social care knowledge has shared some really really fascinating and uh, and kind of quite mind-boggling stats actually but but anything just to kind of wrap up the, the conversation yeah I, I would like to say that given for example if you're recommending vitality products that the dementia and uh, frail care covers a free edition i think it's a question of uh why not rather than why yeah and listen i i I think that last comment from the um, was it Martin in terms of client um, advisors aren't having these conversations, but I'm sure he's right. Um, and I think that's probably because ultimately clients fall into probably one of two categories: either they are at point of need, um, and if they're at point of need, they um, or either they're sort of um, the advisor is going to have to deal with the complexity of helping someone through the, the social care system, which is horrific, um, and advisors aren't trained for that. Or they're, or they're already in care and they want help with funding that care, but most of the time that's going to have to be either equity release or cash. It's not particularly attractive to an advisor. Or even worse, they've been in care for a while and they're down to the last £30,000 and is there anything we can do? Uh, no. Well, the second group is those people who are not at point of need, but realistically just don't believe it's going to be an issue that's going to affect them or they don't want to talk about it or, or the kids will look after me. Trust me, the kids won't. And, and, and let's not let it get so far that they have to find that out firsthand too late. Um, one last question has come in from Steve Markham. Thanks, Steve. Um, just a quick, quick one for you, Tony, about how a care ISA would work in practice. Would it be subject to contribution limits? Would early redemption be allowed? Have you got any thoughts on, or have you got that far with, with a kind of a, a construct for it? Yeah, our, our ask at the moment is that um, the government would allow increased um, limits specifically in relation to care. It, we're also asking them to exempt the, the element of the 
ISA care contribution from any sort of means test, um, and also possibly that anything that's not that's been sort of ring fenced um, but not used for care is free of IHT. That last one probably won't fly, but the other two I think are fundamental. Um, that being said, uh, for, for me this is not so much about um, product, but introducing something that is specifically designed for care just increases that awareness. Because as I said, I don't believe the government are going to go out there and, and tell the truth about the 86,000 pounds, because I don't think they can. So they have to find another way of trying to increase awareness. And helping the industry develop products, for me, is an obvious way of doing it. Yeah, and that assisting the, the three or four people that aren't going to be supported by the, the new cap initiative. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, Tony. That's, no, thanks, Matt. That's, I suppose that sums it up, really, doesn't it? I mean, not only do financial advisors have a role to play, but I think this is very much a role for the private sector. Um, insurers have a role to play, and as you've said, the, the banking sector as well. Um, and, and its awareness is the first step towards solving the problem. Uh, and I guess we're at the stage of very much of awareness with some, with some product development there, but we're, we're quite early on in that journey, it seems. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, well, let's leave it there. We're pretty much out of time. Thanks for your questions, everyone, um, and for tuning in. And Matthew, Tony, thanks so much for your, your time and your expertise today. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone.